Murder on the Lusitania by Edward Marston Read by James Langton Chapter 1 Saturday, September 7th, 1907 George Porter Dillman caught his first glimpse of her at Euston Station. Even in a crowd as large and volatile as that, she stood out, albeit for the briefest and most tantalizing of moments. As he picked his way through the mass of bodies, Dillman was suddenly confronted by a slender young woman in a green straw hat, trimmed with white flowers and a blue velvet ribbon that matched the color of her dress. What struck him was not the sudden beauty of her face or even the delicate sheen of her blonde hair. It was her unassailable confidence. Amid the swirling crowd with its buffeting shoulders and its jostling elbows, she was completely at ease, moving with the grace of a dancer and blithely ignoring the admiring or lustful glances that she collected. Dillman had never met anyone with such an air of self-possession. He stepped back to allow her to pass, touching the brim of his hat and offering a polite smile, but she did not even notice him. A porter trailed in her wake, pushing her luggage on his trolley and warning people to, "'Mind your backs, please!' in a voice that rose above the cacophony. Dillman watched her until she was swallowed up in the throng. Even his unusual height did not permit him to keep track of her for long. The white flowers on her hat soon merged with the vast expanse of floral decoration on the assembled headgear in the station concourse. It was as if a huge garden was on the move, rippling and surging like a multicoloured wave, bearing along with it on the heads of male passengers and well-wishers a motley collection of top-hats, bowlers, homburgs, straw boaters and flat caps of every description. But flowers predominated on that September afternoon, and, in Dillman's mind, her white posies on that green straw hat took pride of place among them. Two minutes later, he was climbing aboard the train and making his way along the corridor in a first-class carriage. It was one of the three specials that had been laid on to take passengers to Liverpool to board the Lusitania on its maiden voyage, an event that had caught the public imagination in the most extraordinary way. The excitement aboard the train was palpable. Even the most phlegmatic travellers were imbued with a sense that they were setting off on a great adventure. They were not merely sailing to New York on the biggest ocean liner in the world. They would be taking part in a voyage of historic significance. Dillman shared the anticipatory delight, though for somewhat different reasons. The compartment he chose already had five occupants, and Dillman had difficulty finding a space on the luggage rack for his valise and his hat. When he sat down with a book in his hand, he distributed a nod among his companions, but got no more than one non-committal glance in return, convincing him that he was part of a wholly English gathering, and could expect conversation from none of them until they were well on their way. The magic of the Lusitania had no doubt touched their souls, but it had as yet failed to break through their natural reserve. He marvelled again at the strange capacity of the English upper-middle classes to suppress any hint of the wild enjoyment they must be feeling. In the third-class carriages, he was sure, passengers were already surrendering to the thrill of the occasion, talking volubly, sharing expectations and forging new friendships. Among those with first-class tickets, pleasure was kept on a much shorter leash. His back to the engine, Dillman was seated at the corridor end of the compartment. When he looked out at the tumult on the platform, he was able simultaneously to take stock of his travelling companions. Beside him on his left was a short, podgy, well-groomed man in his fifties, with thinning hair that had already taken on a silver hue, and a snub nose on which his pince-nez was rather perilously set. His head was buried in a copy of the Westminster Gazette, and a quiet smile played about his lips. Beyond him 
was a lady whom Dillman took to be his wife, a small, slim woman in a fashionable dress of navy serge edged with black braid. Since she was gazing through the window, her hat obscured most of her face from Dillman. Seated opposite the American were three people who quite clearly composed a family. Even if the occasional muttered remark was not passed between them to indicate togetherness, Dillman would have linked them instantly. The young woman who sat between the two older passengers so patently embodied the features of both that she simply had to be their daughter. Her mother, a handsome woman in a gown of French lace, was alternately scanning the platform and turning to look at the young woman with a distant maternal concern. The father, by contrast, a big red-faced man with side whiskers and a permanent chevron etched into his brow, was lost in thought, his hands folded across his stomach, his eyes fixed on some invisible object on the rack opposite him. It was the daughter who really interested Dillman. She had inherited her mother's good looks and her father's prominent chin, but she lacked the animation of either parent. Flicking her head to and fro, the one seemed to be buzzing with controlled energy and, even in a reflective mood, the other exuded a kind of dormant vitality. Their daughter, however, dressed in a smart blue frock of striped zephyr, was so lacklustre as to appear almost ill. Her face wore an expression of grim resignation, and it occurred to Dillman that she looked less like a girl about to undergo a thrilling maritime experience with her parents than a female prisoner being escorted by two warders. The pandemonium outside increased audibly as late arrivals hurried to join the train and porters trundled past with the last of the trunks and suitcases, Tearful farewells took place the entire length of the platform before a warning was shouted and a whistle was blown. The engine then came to life, displaying its power with a series of thunderous emissions of steam, inching away, then slowly gathering speed. A great concerted cheer went up from those on the platform as they sent friends and relations off on the first stage of their journey of a lifetime. It was only then that the young woman came fleetingly awake. She sat bolt upright and flung a wistful glance through the window. Dillman noted the colour that rose to her cheeks. When the train pulled clear of the station, however, her interest vanished at once, and she sagged back into morose introspection. After subjecting her to careful scrutiny, her mother gave a gentle sigh of relief then traded a knowing glance with her husband, who had been jerked out of his reverie by the movement of the train. He gave a satisfied nod, then reached for a copy of the Times which was tucked in beside him. Letting out an occasional grunt of approval, he read his way through the correspondence columns. The train steamed on through the afternoon sunshine, and settled into a jolting rhythm that was punctuated by the clicking of the wheels over the track. The small woman eventually dozed off to sleep, the two men remained immersed in their respective newspapers, and the mother had a muted conversation with her daughter. Unable to hear anything of what they were saying, Dillman opened his novel and began to reacquaint himself with the joys of Nicholas Nickleby. No journey was ever complete without Charles Dickens beside him to stave off boredom. A contented silence soon descended on the compartment, broken only by the rustling of the newspapers and the subdued clamour of the train itself. It was the short, podgy man who finally spoke aloud. "'By Jove!' he said, and let out a chortle. The Times was immediately lowered, and dark eyes inspected him. "'You find something amusing, sir,' said the red-faced man. "'Extremely amusing. In the Westminster Gazette.' "'continued the other with unfeigned contempt. "'That is a liberal newspaper.' "'I care nothing for its politics,' explained the podgy man, "'anxious not to give offence. "'I chose the Gazette because of its competitions.' "'Competitions, sir. "'Intellectual diversions. "'Indeed. "'Some quite serious, others mere trifles.' They would not be enough to entice me to buy such a periodical. 
It is bad enough to have to endure a liberal government without paying to read its insidious propaganda. There is no propaganda in this quotation from Shakespeare, said the other defensively. A prize of two guineas was offered for the best rendering into Greek iambics of this passage from the bard. The winning entry shows remarkable scholarship. Is that what provoked your mirth? Good heavens, no. I am a Balliol man. I revere a classical education. What tickled me was this sublime piece of nonsense under the heading of Advice in One Dozen Emergencies. Twelve problems were set, and each competitor had to provide twelve pithy answers. The winner has a true sense of the ridiculous. Oh, take number six, for instance, said the portly man, eager to share his pleasure. Question. G, engaged to Ethelinda, cannot afford to marry her, and would be relieved if she would break the engagement. How would he induce this? Dillman saw the scowl on the face of the man opposite him, and elected to supply the encouragement that the other frankly denied. He turned to his neighbour. "'What is the answer given, sir?' asked Dillman. "'It is so troll. How does a man induce his fiance to break the engagement?' "'Answer, wear ready-made clothes and grow a beard.' The podgy man chortled again and Dillman gave a quiet chuckle, but the trio opposite were not amused. The mother pursed her lips in disapproval, the father retreated pointedly behind his own newspaper, and the daughter seemed on the verge of tears. But the conversational ice had now been broken, and Dillman felt able to speak openly. You mentioned a competition involving Shakespeare, sir. There are three, my friend said his companion, apart from the winning entry in Greek iambics, there are two new competitions relating to the bard. In the first, they are offering two guineas for the best rendering of a Shakespearean sonnet into Latin elegiacs, in the manner of Catullus or Propertius. Which sonnet might that be? When in disgrace with fortune or men's eyes... Dillman closed his eyes and whispered the next few lines... I all alone bewail my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself, and curse my fate. Well done, sir, you know it by heart. Shakespeare is my first love, admitted Dillman, opening his eyes again. I was reared on his plays and sonnets. Uh, then an American education may not be as flawed as we have been led to believe, teased the other gently. "'Ignore my levity,' he added quickly, removing his pince-nez. "'I do not mean to be facetious. My name is Cyril Weeks. I am delighted to meet you.' "'George Dillman,' said the other, shaking the proffered hand. Dillman was then introduced to Ada Weeks, and one side of the compartment was soon engaged in polite but lively discourse— it was only a matter of time before Dillman's accent parted the red-faced man from his newspaper. He gave a patronizing smile. I had a feeling that you were not English, he observed. Not for want of trying, sir, replied Dillman. I bought my suit and hat on Bond Street and do my best to ape your behavior, but I will never be taken for a true-born Englishman. I fear that I am stamped for life as an irredeemable Bostonian. "'With a surprising knowledge of Shakespeare's sonnets,' noted Weeks, giving him a complimentary nod. "'Actually, I am much stronger on his plays.' "'We may civilize you yet, then,' said the red-faced man, baring his teeth in a condescending grin. He gestured at the book in Dillman's hand. "'And I see that you have discovered Dickens as well.' "'Far too unsavoury an author for my taste, but one has to concede the fellow's talent.' Shakespeare and Dickens, eh? English literature clearly has charms to soothe the savage American breast. Dillman had to endure a whole series of such inane comments from the Times reader, but he did so willingly, because they broke down the last social barriers and brought the whole compartment into the general conversation. The novelty of his American nationality initiated a flurry of questions from both men and from their wives. 
Instead of being the outsider in the group, Dillman now became its focal point. In due course, he learned the names of Matthew and Sylvia Rymer. Their daughter Violet was less forthcoming, but even she took a gradual interest in the tall stranger with the exquisite manners. It was Violet Rymer who asked the most obvious question. "'Which ship did you sail on to get here, Mr. Dillman?' "'The Lucania.' "'She is leaving for New York today before the Lusitania.' "'Yes,' agreed her father, "'and part of me wishes that I were aboard her. "'The Lusitania is the finer vessel, "'but I believe that the Lucania has the most precious item in its cargo.' "'What do you mean, Matthew?' asked his wife. "'It is not a question of what, but of whom, my dear.' The details are here in my newspaper. Sailing on the Lucania is the MCC cricket team. They are having a five weeks tour of America. Rymer looked across at Dillman. I dare say that you have no idea what MCC stands for, do you? I fear not, sir, said Dillman deferentially, knowing quite well that the initials stood for the illustrious Marylebone Cricket Club but playing the ignorant foreigner so that Rymer could resume his lofty tone and sermonize. Perhaps you would enlighten me. Matthew Rymer needed no more invitation. One thumb in his waistcoat pocket, he described the game of cricket in detail, and spoke of the MCC's seminal place in its history. The recital drew a few respectful complaints from his wife, and put a glazed look into his daughter's eye, but he ploughed on relentlessly, and Dillman learned even more about the structure of the family who sat opposite him. Matthew Rymer was a preeminent example of a man who was master in his own house. Cyril Weeks could not be kept silent for long, but his wife was happy to contribute nothing but the odd smile and stray remark. Weeks volunteered the information that he and Ada were sailing to New York to celebrate his retirement from business though he did not specify the nature of that business. Rymer announced that the trip was a present for Violet on the occasion of her forthcoming twenty-first birthday, but Dillman saw no sign of enthusiasm for the voyage in her eyes. The expensive gift instead seemed to depress her. The most she could rise to was a wan smile. "'What is it like to sail the Atlantic, Mr. Dillman?' asked Weeks. "'Invigorating, sir.' Are we in danger of seasickness? Not in a vessel as large as the Lusitania, said Dillman confidently. You will feel as comfortable as if you were in the Ritz Hotel. It is first-class travel in every sense. So it should be, are those prices, mumbled Rymer. Tell us about New York, Mr. Dillman, said his wife. How does it compare with London, for instance? What should we aim to see? As the conversation gathered pace and intimacy, Dillman stroked his moustache and basked in the warmth of acceptance. Long before they reached Liverpool, he received separate invitations from the Rymers and the Weekses to join them for dinner during the voyage. Friendship was secured. Dillman had the camouflage he needed. He was in. It was a good start. Chapter 2 Few cities in Europe had as impressive a maritime history as Liverpool, and none could match the pride and fervour with which the port sent off each successive ship on its maiden voyage. But even Liverpool had never known such an occasion as the departure of the Lusitania on its first Atlantic crossing. The latest addition to the Cunard Line excited such curiosity and inspired such patriotic feeling that people came from all over the country to witness the event. Huge crowds milled along both banks of the Mersey, swelling in numbers until they passed the 200,000 mark. The object of their veneration, the elegant giant known as the Lusitania, had been anchored in midstream throughout most of the day, while the Lucania took on passengers once the pride of the line, the latter now looked small, old, and dowdy, when seen beside the looming beauty of the new vessel. When the Lucania set sail at 4.30 p.m., the Lusitania moved slowly into its vacant berth, drawing a gasp of awe from the spectators 
as they watched a ship that was longer than the Houses of Parliament glide effortlessly over the water. It was a marvel of marine engineering. Many in the crowd wondered how a vessel with a gross weight of 31,500 tons could remain so buoyant in the water. Here was a ship that was not only the biggest and most luxurious in the world, its quadruple screw propellers were powered by four direct-acting steam turbines and were capable of generating speeds in excess of anything ever seen in an oceanic liner. None of those now staring at the huge vessel with its four red funnels gleaming in the sunshine doubted for a moment that it would regain the blue ribband, the unofficial prize for the fastest Atlantic crossing from the unworthy hands of the Nord Deutsche Lloyd Line. British pride had been severely dented when its maritime ascendancy was usurped by Germany, with technically advanced liners such as the Kaiser Wilhelm der Große and the Deutschland. Centuries of dominance came to a juddering halt, a situation compounded by the fact that the German navy was now growing at an alarming rate. Political motives came into play, Government subsidies were hastily offered to Cunard. The Lusitania and its sister ship, the Mauritania, due to have its own maiden voyage in November, were built expressly as a means of reasserting British supremacy on the high seas and of sending a clear message to the German government. Activity around the ship reached a peak as passengers converged eagerly on the pier. The customs sheds worked at full stretch, Port officials were out in full numbers, a sizable police presence had been drafted to control the crowds, and a small army of hawkers moved among the spectators to sell food, drink, flags, postcards, and assorted souvenirs. The majority of passengers arrived by train, but several were delivered by horse-drawn cabs or spluttering automobiles, each competing for space in the congested traffic. Electric trams brought those who could afford no better transport, and open carts emblazoned with the name Lusitania were pulled by pairs of horses from the hostels where emigrants had stayed overnight with their meagre belongings. Rich and poor alike streamed aboard the vessel, caught up in their heady excitement and determined to savour what was self-evidently one of the most important events in their lives. Coal barges had already filled the bunkers, and the decks had been swept clean of any lingering dust. The crew looked smart and alert. There was a reassuring sense of readiness about them. Wearing trim uniforms and welcoming smiles, stewards waited to conduct passengers to their cabins and to provide basic information about the regimen aboard. In the ship's kitchens, the chefs and their staff were already preparing the first meal. Saloon bars were well stocked, and barmen were at their stations. George Porter Dillman gazed around the pier to take it all in. As he strolled towards the ship, he looked at the shining faces of well-wishers and listened to the constant barrage of noise. He had never known such an atmosphere of excitement. It was intoxicating. When the shadow of the Lusitania fell across him, Dillman paused to stare up at its massive hull and shook his head in wonder. Unlike most of the other passengers, he had already had a privileged tour of the vessel, but its sheer proportions still took his breath away. With an overall length of 785 feet and a breadth of 88 feet, she dwarfed every craft in sight. The river was dotted with steamboats. Fishing smacks, motor boats, yachts, and dozens of rowing boats that had come to wave the Lusitania off. Against the great Cunard liner they were minnows beside a whale. "'Awesome, isn't she?' said a voice at Dillman's elbow. He turned to see Cyril Weeks standing there with his wife on his arm. The two of them looked up at the ship with controlled glee. "'Incredible!' said Ada Weeks. "'Quite incredible!' "'Yes,' agreed Dillman. "'Truly magnificent.' "'We are so fortunate to be here!' "'It is a great day for all of us, Mrs. Weeks.' "'Let us see if she has an interior to match,' suggested Weeks, moving forward. Dillman fell in beside them and joined the queue for the first-class gangway. "'I must say I did not expect to see crowds as large as this. 
Liverpool is such a friendly city, rather drab and undistinguished in many ways, but undeniably friendly. You have been here before, sir, said Dillman. Oh, yes, Mr. Dillman, we come to Aintree every year. Aintree? For the Grand National. A famous steeplechase, explained his wife. I know that, Mrs. Weeks, said Dillman. Its fame has spread across the Atlantic. I am just grateful that it was not mentioned in the presence of Mr. Rymer, he added wryly, or he would no doubt have felt obliged to lecture me on the whole history of the turf in England and the mysteries of bloodstock, with the very best of intentions, of course. They shared a laugh. Weeks gave an apologetic shrug. Do not be too harsh on us, Mr. Tillman, he said. Not all Englishmen are quite so arrogant as Rymer. I fear that he suffers from the national disease of insularity. This voyage may broaden his mind, though I beg leave to doubt it. You may have to endure more tutorials from him. I don't mind, said Dillman. I just wish he didn't raise his voice every time he speaks to me. Mr. Rymer seems to think that being an American is akin to being both deaf and stupid. "'Whereas you are patently neither,' observed Weeks shrewdly. "'Indeed not,' reinforced his wife. Dillman acknowledged the compliment with a smile, then followed them up the gangway. He liked Cyril and Ada Weeks. They struck him as a pleasant couple with a marriage that was happy, without being too cosy. Weeks was an educated man, a classical scholar from Oxford, yet he carried his erudition lightly. His wife was a quiet, watchful woman, with a twinkle in her eye. Though he liked the rhymers less, Dillman nevertheless found them more intriguing. They seemed to be carrying a lot of emotional problems with them, and Dillman looked forward to finding out exactly what they were. Behind the easy pomposity of Matthew Rymer, he sensed, was a bristling anger, and he wondered what had caused it. One thing was certain, both his wife and daughter were afraid of him and something even more than fear lurked in the eyes of Violet Rymer. There were eighty-seven special cabins in the first class, most of which were situated on the promenade deck. The remainder of the first-class cabins were on the main, upper, and boat decks, all of them accessible by the grand staircase, which more than justified its name. The entrance to the staircase was on the main deck, and thus convenient for gangways from docksides, landing stages, and tenders. When they left the amiable turmoil of the quayside, first-class passengers entered a palatial world of woven carpets, embroidered curtains, panelled walls, dazzling mirrors, ornate light fittings, windows glazed with specially etched glass, and upholstered furniture of the highest quality. It was truly a luxury hotel on the water. Genevieve Macefield stepped aboard with an elation tempered with mild regret. Travelling alone, she was looking forward to the voyage and to setting foot on American soil, but a few uncomfortable memories still clung to her. Genevieve accepted that it might take time to shake them all off. Meanwhile, she could enjoy the pleasures of being a first-class passenger on the most remarkable ocean liner ever constructed. The steward who led her to her cabin on the upper deck was a tall man in his thirties with brilliantined hair and a flashy handsomeness that was kept in check by a submissive manner. One glance at Genevieve was enough to ignite his interest, and he did his best to ingratiate himself with her, carrying her valise and assuring her that the rest of her luggage had already been brought aboard and stowed in her cabin. A veteran of Atlantic crossings, he knew the importance of first impressions. Single women appreciated an attentive steward. Who knew where that appreciation might lead? Experience had taught him that social etiquette, so inflexible ashore, was sometimes abandoned at sea. The romance of an Atlantic crossing could turn single ladies into viable targets for the right man. When he unlocked her cabin door, he stepped smartly back out of her way so that she could go in first to appraise her accommodation. Sweeping into the middle of the room, Genevieve pirouetted and looked around the whole cabin. 
It was sumptuous. The colours were tasteful, the decor superb. The bed had a comforting solidity, with its headboard quilted, its valance embroidered. Genevieve could not resist trying the springs with her hand. She gave a nod of approval, then moved to study herself in the gilt-framed mirror as she removed the green straw hat to reveal lustrous fair hair parted in the middle and gathered into a small bun at the rear. The steward watched with growing fascination and ran his tongue across his upper lip. "'Is there anything I can get you?' he asked softly. "'Not at the moment. Are you sure, miss?' "'Quite sure.' "'Would you like to be shown around the ship?' "'In time, perhaps.' "'Call me when you're ready,' he said, gaining in confidence. "'But I understood that I was to have a stewardess.' "'Yes, miss, a stewardess will look after your cabin.' He flashed a knowing grin, and took a step towards her. "'But she may not be able to provide you with all that you want.' Genevieve turned to confront him with an inquiring smile. "'All that I want?' "'Extras, miss.' "'Extras?' "'Personal attention.' "'Ah, I see,' she said, torn between amusement and annoyance. "'Just ring the bell, and I'll come running. "'I'll bear that in mind.' "'My name is Eric,' he said, taking a bolder step towards her. "'Eric?' "'Yes.' "'I'll bear that in mind as well,' said Genevieve sweetly. "'And if you ever come near my cabin again, Eric, "'I will mention your name to the chief steward. "'I require no personal attention from you, young man. "'Oh, consider it as your offer is.' "'The steward backed away, crestfallen. "'He groped for an apology. "'No offence was intended, miss. "'Are you in the habit of bothering female passengers? "'Of course not. "'I am glad to hear that she said softly, because some of them might not be as forgiving as I am. Let us pretend that we never even met each other, shall we? Good-bye, Eric. Close the door behind you, please. He removed the key from the lock, set it down on the table, and scurried out before shutting the door gently behind him. Genevieve turned back to the mirror to scrutinise herself for a moment. A hand fluttered up to touch her hair, she then adjusted the brooch at her neck. She was pleased with the way in which she had dealt with the steward. Eric would no doubt describe the encounter to his colleagues, and the word would go out. Her territory was inviolable. She would have no further trouble from amorous young stewards with inflated ideas about the power of their masculinity. Eric's advances had been so direct and presumptuous that they were almost comical. Genevieve laughed aloud. Expectation built steadily to a climax. At 9 p.m. precisely, the deep boom of the Lusitania's whistle echoed right across the river. With her cargo, her mail bags, and over 2,000 passengers aboard, she was ready to begin her momentous journey. Standing on the bridge with his officers, Captain James Watt checked his watch, then gave the order to set his ship in motion. The maiden voyage began. Assisted by tugs and wafted along on the cheers of the watching audience, the Lusitania moved slowly away from the landing stage, ablaze with lights to fend off the approaching dusk. Hats, handkerchiefs, flags and walking sticks were waved madly along both banks. Horns were tooted on every vehicle within sight. Hundreds of cameras recorded the scene. Shrill hoots of acclaim went up from the Mersey ferries and from the other steam craft on the river. Oars were brandished in rowing boats. Fireworks were set off aboard a small yacht. The harbour gulls added their own distinctive cries of joy as they dipped and wheeled in the air. Liverpool was sending yet another ship off on a rolling tide of goodwill. The passengers shared the sense of exhilaration, crowding the decks to view the scene below and acknowledging the ovation with raised palms. The intensity of the experience surpassed anything they had envisaged. Whatever individual reasons they might have for making the trip were submerged in the general euphoria. 
They were all one now. First, second, or third class, they were making history on the churning water of the river. It was an unforgettable moment. Dillman reveled in it. When he looked along the rail on the promenade deck, he saw that even Violet Rymer seemed to be deriving some pleasure at last. Her eyes were alight, her hands clasped tightly together and her hair blown gently by the breeze. For the first time he noticed how attractive she could be. It was only when he moved closer to her that Dillman realised that she was not, in fact, relishing the occasion at all. Violet was raking the quayside with a mixture of hope and despair. Deaf to the remarks of her parents beside her, she was looking for someone among the masses on the shore. The ship moved on, the faces below became white dots in the gloom, and Violet Rymer bit her lip in disappointment. Whomever she had expected to see was not there. Turning away from the rail, she dabbed at a tear with a lace handkerchief. Dillman moved solicitously across to her. "'Are you all right, Miss Rymer? he inquired. "'Yes, yes.' she said, recovering quickly. I'm afraid that I find it all rather overwhelming. So many people, so much noise. They came to wish us bon voyage. Don't let me spoil it for you, Mr. Dillman. Go back to the rail. I'd prefer to talk to you. Would you? she said with surprise. Why? Because we didn't have time for a proper conversation on the train. And not that we can have one here, he said, putting his hands to his ears, as another blast of sound came from the other craft on the river. But I would like to think that we might speak at some stage. She rallied slightly. Thank you, Mr. Dillman. There is one condition, mark you. Condition? I want no more lectures about the MCC. She laughed for the first time since he had met her, a strained, involuntary, high-pitched laugh, but a clear indication that she had a sense of humour. Violet looked guiltily across at her father to make sure that he had not heard her. Then she rolled her eyes with relief. Dillman gave a sympathetic smile. She appraised him with real interest until her shyness got the better of her curiosity. "'I think I'll go back to the rail now,' she said. "'Savor the moment while you may, Miss Rymer. I doubt if either of us will ever see anything quite like this again.' "'No, Mr. Dillman.' We shan't. Violet, called her mother, where are you? Coming, she said, and rejoined her parents at the rail. Dillman saw her shrink back into anonymity, like a flower whose petals suddenly closed. He felt sorry for Violet Rymer, and suspected that her twenty-first birthday would bring her little joy. All he could hope was that her coming of age might, in the fullness of time, give her confidence to stand on her own feet and to escape the vigilance of her parents. When he looked at the back of Matthew Rymer's head, he thought about his own battles with a dictatorial father, and he was reminded that nobody ever won such encounters. Victories were illusory. Each combatant limped away with permanent battle scars. The Lusitania surged on. Though not engaged in a formal race with the Lucania, she was expected to overhaul the older vessel sometime during the night and to reach Queenstown Harbour well before her. But nobody was looking that far ahead. Crew and passengers alike were still luxuriating in the first magical hour of the maiden voyage. Dillman strode the length of the deck, simply enjoying the enjoyment of others, over five hundred first-class passengers were aboard, and every one of them seemed to be on the promenade deck. They included Mr. E. H. Cunard, grandson of the company's founder and the director of the Cunard line. Since he had been allowed to peruse the full list, Dillman knew that he travelled in distinguished company. English aristocrats, like Lord Carradine, graced the ship, along with diplomats, members of Parliament— international financiers, senior churchmen and foreign dignitaries. A name Dillman noted was that of Itzhak Weiss, the renowned violinist. The great, the good and the very wealthy were there in abundance. 
So were representatives of the press. One of them accosted Dillman with a smile. "'Good evening, sir.' "'Good evening,' returned Dillman. "'Ah!' said the newcomer, brightening at the sound of Dillman's voice. "'An American passenger, how fortuitous. "'My name is Henry Barcroft, sir. "'I'm a journalist reporting on the Lucy's maiden voyage "'and trying to talk to as many people as possible. "'What are your impressions so far?' "'Extremely favourable, Mr. Barcroft. "'In what way?' "'Every way. "'She is an astonishing vessel. "'A floating palace.' "'I was not thinking of her passenger facilities, Mr. Barcroft, there, beyond reproach. "'The real glory of the Lusitania lies out of sight, in the engine-room. "'That is where true innovation is taking place.' "'Indeed,' said the other, his interest quickening. "'May I ask if you have any knowledge of marine engineering?' "'As it happens, I do,' confessed Dillman modestly. I was born and brought up less than a mile from the sea and worked in the family business for a while. We design and build ocean-going yachts. Then I've obviously stumbled on the right man. I have a happy knack of doing that. By the way, I did not catch your name. That is perhaps because I did not give it. Dillman spoke with polite firmness. There was something about Barcroft that he did not like, a beaming familiarity that set off warning bells. The journalist was a stocky man of medium height in a dark brown suit. His features were pleasant enough, but his careful grooming suggested vanity. Dillman put his age at around thirty. Barcroft was quite undaunted by the mild rebuff. "'You prefer to remain a man of mystery, do you?' he mocked. "'So be it, sir. I will not intrude on your privacy. Uh, "'But since you have a special interest in the subject, "'you might care to know that this astonishing vessel, as you call it, "'has not been without its problems.' "'Problems?' "'Yes,' said the other airily. "'It is something which Cunard would prefer to hide, "'but the Lucy's final sea trials were not, "'if you will forgive an outrageous pun, plain sailing.' "'Is that so?' The engineers discovered that she had an unfortunate vice. At high speeds her stern vibrated, and I do not refer to mild trembling. She positively shuddered. From what I hear, said Barcroft in a confidential whisper, the stern more or less went into convulsions. Steel plates rattled, streaks and stanchions shook violently. The noise was deafening. They could never put passengers through an ordeal like that. "'I am sure that the problem has been completely overcome. "'Indeed it has, sir. You can probably guess how. "'With an assortment of arches, pillars, gussets, brackets, "'and any other form of bracing, I should imagine. "'Much of it cunningly disguised behind built-in furniture, I dare say. "'Cunard would not bring a ship into service "'until every deficiency was rectified. "'Quite so, but the cost was phenomenal.' Over a hundred and forty second-class cabins had to be gutted to cure the vibration in the stern. You seem well informed, Mr. Barcroft. I am a journalist. It is my job to be well informed. Does that mean it is safe for me to believe everything I read in your newspaper? said Dillman, raising a cynical eyebrow. The American press is nowhere near as reliable. Fact and fiction intermingle there. Barcroft's face hardened. Then an appeasing smile surfaced. "'You're an intriguing man, sir,' he flattered, watching Dillman closely. "'There cannot be many passengers aboard with your professional expertise. I would value a tour of the ship in your company.' "'That will not be possible, I fear. But you could point out all of its salient features.' "'I think you know them already, Mr. Barcroft,' said Dillman levelly. There is nothing I could add which could possibly interest someone as well informed as you. Your comments would be invaluable. I only helped to build yachts, Mr. Barcroft. That is a far cry from marine architecture on this scale. It is the difference between journalism and literature. Between the sort of article you write and the major novels produced by a Dickens or a Thomas Hardy. He saw that he had caught the other man on the roll. For which newspaper do you work, sir? Any and every one. I am freelance. Then I will not keep you from your duties. 
I am sure you will want to employ your happy knack of meeting the right man elsewhere. Barcroft's eyelids narrowed for a second, and he bit back a rejoinder. Then he gave a mirthless laugh and reached forward to pat Dillman on the arm before turning on his heel and moving away. Dillman watched him go. Barcroft insinuated himself into the crowd at the rail and engaged a young couple in conversation. The journalist had soon drawn them into an impromptu interview. There was something relentless and predatory about Henry Barcroft, but that was not the only quality of his that Dillman resented. He sensed a vengeful streak in the man, and had a strong feeling that he had not seen the last of him. During the train journey earlier in the day, Dillman had taken the trouble to make friends with fellow passengers. In Henry Barcroft, he had just made his first enemy. Chapter 3 A carnival atmosphere prevailed aboard until well after midnight. First-class passengers lingered among the potted palms in the dining saloon, which was decorated in the style of Louis the Sixteenth with the predominating colour of vieux rose. One of its outstanding features was a vast mahogany sideboard, ornamented with gilt metal and glistening like a huge beacon. Above the saloon was a circular balcony supported on Corinthian columns, and taking the eye up to the magnificent grand dome with painted panels after Boucher. Those who chose to recline in the lounge found themselves in an equally resplendent room, decorated in the late Georgian period, and featuring fine inlaid mahogany panels, a richly modelled dome ceiling, and superb marble fireplaces. Second-class passengers enjoyed comfort without opulence. The public rooms were large, well-appointed, and tastefully decorated, the facilities comparing favourably with first-class quarters on smaller ships, Public rooms in third class were unashamedly functional, with bare wooden chairs and benches in abundance, and a distinct absence of the luxurious fixtures and fittings that proliferated elsewhere. Almost twelve hundred people, more than half the number of passengers, would cross the Atlantic in third class, and its shortcomings might in time prove irksome. In those early hours of the voyage, however, they were so buoyed up by the general feeling of elation that they had no complaints and were as happy as anyone aboard. Genevieve Macefield chose to have supper with the Hubermans, two sisters whom she had befriended on the train from Euston, and who seemed to think that someone as young and beautiful as she needed a chaperone. Accordingly, they took her under their wing, Carlotta and Abigail Huberman, had been on a grand tour of Europe and were returning to their native Virginia with an endless supply of anecdotes, souvenirs, and objets d'art. Genevieve warmed to them immediately. Both in their early sixties, they were lively companions, pleasantly garrulous but never to the point of boredom, kind, considerate, and always eager to listen to others. Ladies of independent means, they were extremely generous with their time and money. "'How long do you plan to stay, Miss Maysfield?' asked Abigail. "'A month or so, probably.' "'Bless you,' said Carlotta. "'You must stay longer than that. "'What can you see of America in a month? "'We will expect you to spend at least that long with us, won't we, Abigail? "'We insist. "'You simply must come to Virginia.' "'That's a very tempting offer,' said Genevieve. "'I don't wish to spend the whole of my time in New York.' and it would be unfair to impose on my friends indefinitely. By the same token, I would hate to outstay my welcome in Virginia. There is no danger of that, said Carlotta. Is there, Abigail? None whatsoever. It is settled. Abigail Huberman has spoken. No argument will be allowed. Well, said Genevieve, smiling, if you put it like that. We do, they said in unison. They were seated in the lounge, ensconced in plush armchairs beside one of the marble fireplaces. The Hubermans presented a strange contrast. Though they could be identified as sisters at once by certain facial similarities, the resemblance ended there. 
Abigail, the elder of the two, was a thin, angular woman with bony wrists and a delta of blue veins on the backs of her hands. Yet there was no suggestion of fragility. Her energy seemed inexhaustible. Carlotta Huberman was big, plump, and jovial, her fat cheeks tinged with red, her eyebrows arching expressively whenever she spoke. Both were maiden ladies, but Genevieve had the impression that Carlotta's private life had not been without its share of romance. Even in her portly state, she was still a very handsome woman. Abigail sipped her coffee, then regarded Genevieve for a moment. "'I still think you should have reported him, dear,' she said. "'Who?' asked Genevieve. "'That steward, about whom you told us. "'That kind of behaviour is intolerable. "'In your place I would have had him severely reprimanded. "'I didn't wish to make too much of it, Miss Huberman. "'Besides, it was not so much what the fellow did "'as what he was contemplating. "'I found it all rather amusing, to be honest.' To be so open about it, he must have had success in the past. Have the man dismissed, urged Abigail. <laughs> Don't be so ruthless, Abigail, said her sister. It sounds to me as if Genevieve took the right course of action. She put him firmly in his place. Yes, Miss Huberman, I have a stewardess now. There will be no further problems of that kind. None of this would have happened if you had travelled with your own maid argued Abigail, setting her cup and saucer down on the table. Carlotta and I would never go anywhere without Ruby. She is a positive jewel. I dare say she is turning down the beds in our cabin right now. I prefer to travel alone, Miss Huberman, said Genevieve. Except that you are no longer alone, added Carlotta with a grin. You have acquired two strong bodyguards, and the first thing you must do— is to stop calling us Miss Huberman all the time, or it will get very repetitive. We answer to Abigail and Carlotta. I will remember that. Carlotta, prompted the other. Genevieve gave an obedient nod. Carlotta it is. Which part of England do you hail from? wondered Abigail. I was born in Canterbury, but my family moved around a great deal. We lived in Italy for a few years. Which part of Italy? "'Florence, one of our favourite cities,' said Abigail, clapping her hands together. "'Wasn't it, Carlotta? We bought that painting of the Doge in Florence.' "'I thought that it was in Ravenna,' said her sister. "'Florence, dear, I think you will find it was Ravenna. "'We bought the painting of the three musicians there. "'That was definitely in Venice. "'I hate to contradict you, Abigail. "'Then don't, because you are wrong.' "'Not this time, dear. Carlotta!' It was not really an argument, but it allowed both of them to display their characteristic gestures. Abigail used her hands to reinforce her points, but Carlotta relied more on facial expressions.